what does this airplane, this airplane, and even this airplane all have in common? We're going to tell you in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machette. What these airplanes share is the fact that their vertical stabilizers all needed to be enlarged. And this brings us to this episode entitled Tall Tails. Airplanes have conventional tails, T tails, V tails, cruciform tails, sometimes no tails at all. Noted Aviation author Robert Serling once said that aviation progress is made one nut and bolt at a time. And there could be no better example than this machine, the original Wright Glider, which was a year before the Wright Flyer in 1903. I should mention I'm not an aeronautical engineer. I'm not an aerodynamicist. I'm an aviation artist, and I just love airplanes and everything about aviation. And I thought I'd uh, share with you a, a photo essay of aircraft with different types of tails and tell some of the stories about that in this episode. So starting with the right glider, here you see the rudder deflected and it was a very primitive form of control. The elevators ahead of the wing, the rudders behind the wing. Uh, this was essentially a, a large hang glider at that time, but uh, by adding an engine and uh, other design refinements, the Wright brothers created the first controllable powered aircraft. Only five years after the first flight at Kitty Hawk, the Wright B Flyer was sold to the US Army, and this is a more advanced machine. But here you get a better view of the twin rudders and the twin elevators uh, that were fore and aft of the wing. By World War I, not even a decade later, um, aircraft design had advanced to an unbelievable level. Uh, airplanes were flying at 100 miles an hour, they were aerobatic. And here we have a machine with three wings, and what is called a conventional tail. The conventional tail, horizontal and vertical stabilizers, uh, were utilized on uh, most airplanes through the 1930s, the 1940s into World War II. And I should mention, yes, there were other designs. You had the twin tail boom, like on this Lockheed P-38. But for this episode, we're gonna be focusing on conventional tails and the size and shape of the vertical stabilizer. So let's start with the B-29, an elegant machine powered by four Wright R3350 radials. Uh, look at the fuselage, the, uh, ratio, the proportions were just elegant. And again, a very distinctive tail fin, reminiscent in a way of the Boeing B-17. But when the airplane uh, was enlarged, uh, longer fuselage, uh, Pratt & Whitney R4360 radials, uh, more power. And so the need for a taller vertical fin uh, was very evident, and this is the difference in design. Same thing applied to the C-97 uh, Strato Freighter, seen here with the original B-29 engines on the prototype and the B-29 tail. Same thing as it advanced, the uh, 4360s were applied to a double-deck passenger version, the Boeing Stratocruiser with the B-50 tail. In Southern California, uh, Douglas was designing the DC-6 and DC-7, same identical uh, vertical stabilizer. With the 7C, it had upgraded engines, longer wings, stretch fuselage, and so the need for a taller tail, which you see here. Now, believe it or not, the uh, first triple tail airliner was not a Constellation. It was the Douglas DC-4E, an experimental larger four-engined uh, airliner uh, in 1938 with a triple tail. By comparison, the Constellation uh, seen here began as a military transport, uh, the C-69, which flew in 1943, pressurized cabin, very advanced airplane for its time. But why the need for three tail fins? Well, you can see here in these profiles by uh, digital artist, Tony Landis, uh, it's all about uh, area, square footage of the tail fin. And with three fins, you've got the same control authority, same relative uh, square footage, uh, but it is a, a smaller, uh, smaller inside view and much more convenient for uh, hangars with low doors or uh, just general uh, aerodynamic efficiency. The Lockheed tail really began with a series of airplanes, starting with the 10 Electra, moving up through the uh, Model 14, Model 18, Lodestar. Seen here is a custom version of the Lodestar owned by William Lear, obviously named the Lear Star. But look at the 
vertical stabilizers, you can see that distinctive shape. And with the uh, first iteration of the Connie, the Excalibur, you see the twin fins. What they basically did is added a center fin, and that's how they came up with the triple tail design. With the advent of the Super Constellation, the Model 1049, uh, with more power there and a longer fuselage, there needed to be taller fins. Uh, all three had to be uh, enlarged. And so that was achieved with a 13 inch plug that was added just above the horizontal stabilizer. The military version uh, seen here, the WV-2 for the Navy, EC-121 for the Air Force, radar picket called the Warning Star. And this has the central uh, uh, vertical radome that you see there mid fuselage. And this presented an interesting aerodynamic uh, issue. The wetted area essentially blanked out the center fin. And so uh, inadvertently, the outboard fins became uh, very valuable uh, to the design and it became a very successful airplane used uh, throughout the 1950s and early 1960s. Taking that a step further, the Grumman Hawkeye with the large uh, distinctive radar dish above. And the solution to that problem was four separate vertical stabilizers on an extended horizontal. Looking at tactical uh, fighter design, uh, the beginning of the supersonic era, the F-100 Super Sabre, uh, no, here the, mod, the A model seen here uh, at uh, Englewood had the shorter tail, which presented uh, problems. A number of airplanes were lost due to inertia coupling and uh, landing accidents. And so the need for a taller vertical uh, was met with the F-100C. And this is the tail fin that uh, remained through uh, the rest of the production run. America's first Delta Wing airplane, the XF-92A from Convair, uh, designed with uh, data captured from Germany at the end of World War II. Uh, the production version was the y at the beginning of the production version, the YF-102 seen here, same vertical stabilizer. And take a look at the shape. This is the first production airplane, the F-102A. And uh, like the F-100, uh, it was determined that the vertical needed to be larger. So here's the final production iteration of the F-102A Delta Dagger. Sometimes uh, enlarging the tail isn't about the height of the tail, it's the cord uh, width. And so here we have the F-104 Starfighter. Uh, take a good look at the aft uh, part of the tail fin, the rudder, the trailing edge. This is the A through C model. And the G had a different shaped tail, much more distinctive, uh, used by a number of uh, foreign air forces. America's first Mach 2 operational jet fighter. In many cases, the design philosophy of a corporation translates from one era to another. We have the F-7U Cutlass with the twin tails and the F-8 Crusader, Navy's first supersonic uh, jet fighter along with the Grumman F-11F. But look at the shape of the tail fin, very uh, similar. And I should mention that the Cutlass, which had a brief service career, um, was the last Navy jet to have twin tails until the Grumman F-14 Tomcat. We'd seen the uh, Douglas Skyrocket early in the program, and this is the original configuration. It was a jet airplane to begin with, uh, a bit underpowered, but it had the short vertical fin. With rocket power, the vertical was enlarged, as you see here. And this translates to airliners as well. Here's the first version of the Boeing 707, uh, originally called the Jet Straddle Liner. The 707 is a little more catchy, but the original version uh, the uh, straight turbojet engines, shorter fuselage, and it had the uh, more stubby looking vertical stabilizer. With the advent of the Intercontinental 707, a longer fuselage, new wing, fan engines, you notice the taller vertical and the addition of a dorsal fin for uh, added yaw authority at higher angles of attack. By comparison, the DC-8 had a tail fin that never changed. This is the original design, the Model 21, and when the airplane was stretched almost 40 feet to make the Super 60 series or the Super 70 re-engine series you see here. And by the way, it's not a twin engine airplane. That's just an optical illusion. But the uh, four CFM 56s on the 70 series uh, gave the airplane quite a bit of power. And yet that is the same identical vertical stabilizer. Here's some fun. This is the Republic Rainbow, the XR-12. If you're not familiar with this, I have a video all about the Rainbow and a number of other airplanes that you're going to see in this episode. And I have links to those videos in the title block. 
But if you're not familiar with the airplane, look at the aquatic lines, very sleek, elegant machine, world's fastest four engine piston powered airplane to this day. And what do you think the tail is going to look like? You ready? Here it is. I got a lot of comments on the rainbow video. A lot of people said, how could Alexander Cardvelli, the chief designer, put a tail that looked like this on an airplane uh, that was so sleek? The answer was he was using the uh, aerodynamics from the F-84 Thunderjet. If you look at the trailing edge, it's quite similar. We talked about airplanes that didn't have any vertical stabilizers. This is the Northrop YB-35 flying wing. And yes, it's a YB-35. You can see the spinners on the propellers. But uh, when it was converted to the YB-49 jet flying wing, uh, there was a need for short, uh, stubby vertical uh, stabilizers, as you see here. Now, speaking of small vertical stabilizers, this was the X-plane that had the smallest, the Douglas X-3 Stiletto, uh, turbojet-powered airplane, never had the engines it was designed for, a bit uh, underwhelming uh, as an experimental aircraft, but it survived nearly 60 flights with the small vertical stabilizer. And by comparison, the largest vertical stabilizers on an X-plane had to be the X-15. This is interesting. The airplane actually changed the shape of the tail during the flight, meaning if you look here, uh, the upper and lower are the same size, but look closely at the uh, ventral fin, you notice that the lower section with the parachutes on it jettisons away just before the gear comes down and the airplane lands. Uh, it's recovered by parachute. That was done successfully 199 times. And uh, had that not happened, the procedure, as was told to me by Joe Engel, was for the pilot to eject immediately because if that lower fin was still on, the airplane would have become the world's fastest plow just before it cartwheeled into oblivion. And the pilot had no choice but to eject. Thankfully, that never happened. Now, here's the opposite. Here we have an airplane that began with a taller tail, the Boeing B-52. And with the G model, the tail was shortened when they discovered that uh, they didn't need that much area. Uh, this is the configuration that's flying today. It's now the fan-powered H model, and that'll be re-engined uh, shortly. And that is going to be the world's first military airplane uh, to remain in service for nearly 100 years. But that's another story. And in closing, I'm going to uh, have a little name the plane contest. This is the uh, probably one of the neatest tail designs ever. Uh, the entire vertical stabilizer acts as a rudder. I guess you could call it a rudder vader. Uh, can you guess the airplane? It's the North American Vigilante, the RA-5C seen here. Mach 2 design, elegant shape. And the point I want to make is that here we are in the digital age compared to the slide rule era of the earlier airplanes. Uh, now we're looking at machines that are uh, flown with digital flight control systems designed with digital uh, uh, programs. And so the uh, shape of the fin stays pretty much consistent through the production run. So if you look at the prototype F-16, compare that to the production version, some small modifications, but it's the same, same shape of the fin all the way through. And this brings us to the F-14 Tomcat. Uh, 1972 airplane brought twin fins back to uh, Navy tactical fighters. And it was the precursor of all the tactical jets flying today, which are equipped with twin tail fins. So there you have it, a look at tail design through uh, aviation history. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, we'd love to have you on board please do hit the like button. We appreciate that. And uh, uh, we have many more good programs coming up for you in the months ahead. So as always, until next time, take care. <laughs>